All right, so I'm going to be talking about uh, OS 10 security, uh, security model. Um, this is going to be largely covering El Capitan, though first I'm going to start with uh, discussing how Yosemite works. So, but before we get started, there's two things I'd like to mention. Uh, the first is that all the slides, speakers, notes, and the demos are available for download, and I'm going to be providing a link at the end of the talk. Uh, for those folks um, who have trouble keeping up with the speaker while they're speaking and trying to take notes, I'm usually in the same situation, so I assure you there is no need to take notes from uh, this particular talk. Uh, everything I'm going to be covering is going to be available for download, including the notes that I'm speaking from right now. Uh, the second is to please hold all questions until the end. If you've got questions, you know, make a note of them, uh, ask me at the end, uh, and with luck I'll be able to answer most of your questions during the talk itself. So OS X has a layered security model, and it's based on the idea that one layer failing should not defeat all safeguards. By relying on multiple layers of protection, OS X's security model aims to both reduce the opportunities for an attacker and also blunt and delay any attacks that are launched. So Gatekeeper is one of the outer lines of defense. It allows users to restrict which sources they can install applications from, with the general idea that malware will not be from an allowed source. Uh, th and the way it does this is by checking to see if the application is digitally signed and by who. So, there are three ways that Gatekeeper can be set to allow applications as of OS X to El Capitan. Uh, the first is the Mac App Store, and this allows only applications downloaded from the Mac App Store to be launched. Uh, Gatekeeper, in this case, is checking for the certificate used by App Store apps, and it's only allowing those applications. Uh, the second is App Store and Identified Developers. Um, this allows applications downloaded from the App Store or those applications signed by certified developers to be launched. And this is the default setting in 10.8 and later, and it allows developers to distribute apps outside of the App Store. So here, Gatekeeper is checking for the certificate used by App Store apps or the Apple developer ID certificates used by certified developers. And the last way you can set Gatekeeper as of OS X El Capitan is to anywhere, which allows all applications to be launched. So this really means that Gatekeeper is effectively off. It's not really checking certificates, and anything downloaded can be launched or otherwise accessed. So the OS does still notify you that you downloaded this and where you got it from. Well, why is it doing that? Gatekeeper's off. Well, another layer to the defenses is showing in this dialog box, which is known as file quarantine. Now, this was first introduced back in 10.5 as a way to provide at least some protection against malware by informing users of what they were downloading and from where. So with Gatekeeper off, file quarantine's notifications are mostly informational, and they don't really block anything. However, Apple has built on the foundations of file quarantine to create XProtect, which is Apple's built-in malware detection system. So XProtect checks application file signatures rather than certificates. So it's able to work with Gatekeeper to detect malware disguised inside of applications and prevent their launch. So Apple considers Gatekeeper's role as being so important that as of Yosemite and later, disabling Gatekeeper does not mean that it is permanently off. After a set amount of time, which is currently set to 30 days, uh, the OS function shown will automatically re-enable Gatekeeper with the Mac App Store and Identified Developer setting. So for those interested, there's more information on that process available via the link shown on the screen. So OS X also uses sandboxing extensively. A sandbox typically provides a tightly controlled set of resources uh, for programs to run in. So network access, the ability to inspect the host system, or read from input devices, are usually disallowed or they're heavily restricted. So the nice way to think about it is that your apps have their own nice little box to work in, and they can't interfere with each other. However, this is probably a better way of depicting how sandboxing works. The app is in its own jail, and it only gets access to whatever resources the OS allows through to that jail. So the next layer of defenses is the Unix permissions model that OS X uses. And this governs which users and groups can access which files and directories. Now, if a particular user account requests access to a particular file or directory and it does not have the necessary rights, that account is refused access. And the innermost layer of defenses are the keychains. So keychains are very specialized databases which are designed for the storing of secrets. So like passwords, uh, private keys, PIN numbers, the like, and then controlling access to those secrets. So to help protect those secrets, keychains are encrypted. And this cryptographic protection is why if you don't know a keychain's password, you aren't getting into one. 
So this is the security model as of OS 10 Yosemite. It looks okay, right? Well, there is a long-standing issue with the defense model, and it's really been there for decades. It lies in the POSIX permissions layer, and it pre-exists OS X. It even pre-exists Apple as a company. Root is the super user for a Unix system. It can do anything, and getting root privileges on a system via privilege escalation is the goal for most malware. So Unix is designed to let the root account have access to anything. Um, when asking what root can do on a system, it may be better to ask what root cannot do because that list is going to be very, very short. If you want to completely compromise the system, getting root privileges is a reliable path to success. So Apple's not ignored this issue, and they've put some controls in place to limit the actual root user. So these controls include disabling the root user account, discouraging its use, and providing alternate ways to access elevator or root privileges using other means. However, this root user is still present and can still do anything on your system. So to limit what the super user can do and add another layer to OS X security model, Apple has developed System Integrity Protection, or SIP, for OS X El Capitan and later. So SIP is designed to limit the power of root and protect the system even from its own super user. So as part of this new security model, the OS X kernel has new SIP-related functionality built into it to prevent processes from writing to certain protected parts of the file system. SIP's configuration is stored in NVRAM. So the current configuration uh, will apply even when boot drives are switched and also if the OS is reinstalled. So SIP is an overall security policy with the goal of preventing system files and processes from being modified by third parties. So to achieve this, it has the following concepts. It has file system protection, it has runtime protection, and it has kernel extension protection. So Apple has set a number of directories used by OS X as being protected by SIP. So with some exceptions, which I'll be talking about in a little bit, uh, all files and folders contained within these directories cannot be moved, edited, or changed by root or any other user on the system. And Apple has also set a number of directories used by OS X as being explicitly available to developers. So in one of the exceptions I was just talking about, uh, slash user is protected by SIP, but slash user local is not. So that means that developers are explicitly permitted to place files and folders inside of slash user local without worrying that Apple is going to lock down that directory. And SIP's protections are not limited to protecting the, uh, the system from file system changes. So there's also system calls which are now restricted in their functionality. For example, dtrace can't inspect system processes, either using the instruments application or the dtrace command line tool. However, SIP does not block inspection by the developer of their own applications while they're being developed. So Xcode's tools will continue to allow apps to be inspected and debugged during the development process, even if SIP is on. So for more information on this, I really recommend taking a look at Apple's developer documentation for SIP, which is available by the link on the screen. Now, SIP also blocks installation of unsigned kernel extensions. In order to install a kernel extension with SIP enabled, a kernel extension must be signed with the developer ID for signing KEX certificate, which is a special developer ID uh, certificate, which Apple's kind of reluctant to hand out. And it must be installed into library extensions. So more information on this is also available in Apple's developer documentation for SIP. So for those interested, the kernel extension documentation is available by the link on the screen. So SIP has a configuration file, which is stored in system library sandbox and is named rootless.conf. And it lists all the applications and the top level directories which SIP is protecting. So this is a list that's kind of hard to read all at once. So I'm gonna break it down into what's protected in applications and what's being protected outside of applications. So SIP is protecting the core apps, which OS X installs into applications and applications utilities. So this means it will no longer be possible to delete the Apple applications which OS X installs, even from the command line when using root privileges. And SIP is also protecting a number of directories and sim links outside of applications. And the top level of those directories are also listed in rootlist.conf. However, if you notice, some listings have an asterisk in front of the directory. So Apple has defined some exceptions for SIP in the rootlist.conf file, and those exceptions are marked with the asterisks. So two important ones for Mac admins are the exceptions made for the user template folders and for user libexec cups, which is where OS X stores its printer configuration information. So this is in addition to the exception made for user local that I previously mentioned. 
And there's also some interesting mixing of protection modes visible in this configuration file. For example, there's an asterisk in front of system library extensions, which means that the directory has an exception from being protected by SIP. The very next line has an asterisk following system library extensions, which in this case is a wildcard for everything inside the directory. So system library extensions as a directory has an exception to SIP, but then everything stored inside that directory is protected by SIP. So you have that interesting mixing, and I'm not quite sure why Apple set it up that way. So when I spoke to, with Apple engineers about how this configuration file was updated and if we could add our own exceptions to it, it was made perfectly clear that Apple considers this file theirs, and any third party's changes to it would be overwritten by Apple. So updates to these configuration files are coming via software update, uh, and that's similar to how Apple has been updating Gatekeeper and Xprotex configuration files. So to see which files have been protected by SIP, use the ls command with dash capital O in terminal. SIP protected files will be labeled as restricted. So for example, here are the SIP protected directories and SIM links available at the root level of the boot drive. So one important thing to know about this is that even if a SIM link is protected by SIP, that does not necessarily mean that the directory they're linking to is being protected by SIP. So at the root level, there are several SIP protected SIM links pointing to directories stored inside the root level directory named private. However, if we look inside that directory named private, the directories that those sim links are pointing to are not protected by SIP, and both they and their contents can be moved, edited, or changed by processes using root privileges. And in addition to the list of SIP exceptions defined in rootless.conf, there's in fact a second list of SIP exceptions. Now this list includes a number of directories and application names for third-party products. Like rootless.conf, this exclusion list is Apple's, and any third party's changes to it will be overwritten by Apple. So if you want to see the current list, it's available via the link shown on the screen. So SIP can be managed to the extent of turning it on, turning it off, adding and removing IP addresses into a netboot whitelist, and reporting on whether or not SIP is enabled or disabled. So the tool to use to do this is user bin CSR util. Now, when you run CSR util without any associated commands, it pulls up the help page. So CSR util is able to work with SIP because it has a unique application entitlement assigned to it by Apple. And this entitlement is viewable using the code sign command shown on the screen. So to help ensure that SIP cannot be turned off or otherwise affected by malware or other attacks, it can only be disabled while booted into the recovery environment, like recovery HD or internet recovery. So when booted from recovery, the command used to enable SIP is csrutil enable. And let's take a look at how this works. So I've booted into recovery, and first thing I'm running is csrutil status. It's showing me that uh, SIP is disabled, so I want to go ahead and turn it on. So I run csrutil enable, and it tells me it's on, but I need to restart. Anytime you make a change to SIP, you always need to restart the machine. Now, the fact that you have to boot into recovery to make changes in the first place, kind of makes that a built-in part of the process, but it is important to know. All right, so we booted back to the regular OS. Let's go ahead and log in. All right, let's go ahead and uh, go into terminal. Going to go ahead and run CSR start. CSR util status again, and now it's showing up that SIP is enabled. So when booted from recovery, the command you use to turn SIP off is CSR util disable. And it's the same process you just saw. Um, you're just doing it, you know, you boot to recovery, you just tell it, turn it off. The bless command in El Capitan is restricted by SIP, and this affects bless's ability to set max to boot from netboot sets. Now, when booted from recovery, you can whitelist netboot server IPs as being approved for use by the bless command. So to do this, you would run csrutil netboot add, followed by the IP address of a netboot server. So let's take a look at how this works. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run csrutil netboot list, and it's going to tell me I don't have a list. There's no configuration found. So let's go ahead and add a couple of entries. So I'm going to run csrutil netboot add, put in my first IP address, and they must be IP addresses. This doesn't work with DNS. Uh, let's go ahead and add a second. So CSR util netboot add, and then put in my second IP. All right? 
And let's just double check to make sure both of them are in there. So we're gonna go ahead and run CSR Util Netboot list again. And as you can see, both of our IP addresses are now listed. So let's go ahead and restart. All right, go ahead and log in. And let's go into terminal. And we're gonna go ahead and run CSR util status. And as you can see, SIP is enabled, but now we have a new listing for allowed netboot sources, which lists both of, both of our IPs. So you have two ways of seeing which uh, uh, IPs are listed. Um, you can use CSR util status, in which case it'll list them as allowed netboot sources. You can also use uh, CSR util netboot list, and it'll just show you the IPs. So when booted from recovery, you can also remove netboot servers from the whitelist. In this case, you would use uh, CSR util netboot remove, followed by the IP address that you want to remove from your whitelist. So to see which ser netboot servers have been added to the whitelist, you would run CSR util netboot list, as I'd mentioned before. And there's also uh, one more command called CSR util clear. And this resets SIP and it clears the netboot whitelist. And after a reboot, SIP is enabled if it wasn't previously. So running CSR util netboot list after that point will also show you that no netboot IPs are listed. So let's take a look at how that works. So we're gonna go ahead and run CSR util status. Uh, looks like SIP is disabled and I have a couple of uh, allowed net, uh, netboot IPs in the whitelist. So I'm gonna tell it run CSR util clear. Tells me it successfully cleared SIP and to please restart. All right, let's go ahead and log back in again. And once again, let's go back into terminal. Uh, let's go ahead and run CSR till status. Uh, it tells me that SIP is enabled. And if we go ahead and then run CSR util netboot list, it tells me that there's no configuration found, which means that there is no whitelist at all. So if you try to run the CSR util enable and disable commands while booted from a regular boot drive, you will receive a message that these commands need to be run from recovery, and the current SIP configuration will remain unchanged. Likewise, if you try to run the CSR util netboot add and remove commands while booted from a regular boot drive, you will receive a message that CSR util was unable to save the configuration, and the status of your netboot whitelist will remain unchanged. So what can you run with CSR util when you're booted from regular boot drive? Well, you can run CSR util's reporting functions. For example, to learn if uh, SIP is enabled or disabled, you can run CSR util status. Now this command can be run without root privileges and it will tell you whether or not SIP is on or off. Likewise, you can run CSR util netboot list and report on which IPs have been set as allowed netboot sources when using the bless command. Now one other thing to know about SIP and recovery is that there are two environments where SIP's protections are disabled. Uh, one is the OS X installer environment, which is how Apple will be able to upgrade a SIP-protected Mac uh, going forward into the future with Sierra. And the other is the recovery environment. Now, in fact, the two are actually the same environment, they just have different names. And the main difference between the OS X installer environment and the recovery environment is that recovery doesn't have a locally uh, stored cache of OS X installer files available. That's the main difference. So the other place where SIPs protections will be disabled is in specific circumstances where installer is installing software. So those special circumstances are where Apple has signed the installer packages certificate with Apple's own certificate. So developer IDs signed packages will not be able to alter SIP protected files or directories. Only Apple has this particular certificate to make this work. Okay, so at this point we've discussed a number of things. Most of which ended in can only be changed in the recovery environment. So, where does this leave us as Mac admins? So let's tackle netboot first. So SIP affects the bless command's ability to set alternate boot disks, including the ability to set a netboot set as a startup drive. So the first question to, ask, uh, to answer for yourself is, do you use bless to set your Macs to netboot? If the answer is yes, you'll need to whitelist. But if the answer is no, you shouldn't need to whitelist. 
So why is this? Well, the root of the issue is that SIP now restricts the bless command's ability to write to NVRAM. Meanwhile, the bless command must write to NVRAM as part of setting a Mac to boot to a netboot set. So to address this, Apple added the netboot whitelist to SIP. So this whitelist defines which IPs Bless can write to NVRAM without otherwise compromising SIP's protections. So how can you tell if you don't need to use Bless? Well, open startup disk and system preferences and see if your netboot set or sets appear there. If you can see it, that means you have a netboot server on your local subnet or helper IPs have been set up to allow your Mac to boot to a netboot server located outside your local subnet. So if your netboot sets or sets are visible in startup disk, SIP won't affect your ability to netboot. You can use startup disk to select a netboot set. You can hold down the N key at startup to boot from your environment's default netboot set. Or you can hold down the option key at startup and select your netboot set that way. So the main exception would be if you're using the bless command in a script or other means to automate netbooting from a particular netboot set. So in that case, despite the fact that your netboot set is available in system preferences, because you're using bless in the process, you will still need to whitelist that netboot server using CSR util. So I'd mentioned helper IPs on the previous slides, but not everyone may be familiar with these. So these are settings in the configuration of your network equipment. So you'll need to work with your network folks to set them up. Most folks have their networks subdivided into VLANs these days. So you'll need to have helper IP set up on the various VLANs where you want to have netboot available. So how helper IPs work is that they re relay all DHCP packets to the specified IP address which will be the IP of your netboot server. Now, this DHCP relay doesn't break anything. It just makes sure that your netboot server is able to hear the broadcast DHCP request that your Mac is sending out when your Mac wants a netboot. So Parallels has a pretty good write-up on how all this works, which is available via the link on the screen. And I'll also be providing links to more information at the end. So if you're using Bless, you will need to use the CSR util, uh, utility while booting into recovery to whitelist the IPs of your netboot servers. So Apple has also provided a way to set the whitelist when you're using system image utility to build a net install or a net restore set. So this option is an automator action called Bless Netboot Server, and it's made available when you click the Customize button in System Image Utility. So to have your netboot IPs whitelisted, you would enter the relevant IPs into the Bless Netboot Server entry blanks. And then once you've added the IPs into the workflow and built the boot set, your netboot server IPs will be automatically added to the SIP whitelist on machines set up by the relevant net install or net restore set. So is there any special magic in this particular automator action? Well, not really. You could replicate what it does using a script similar to the one shown on the screen. The crucial detail is that you need to run this script while you're booted into the recovery environment. And the blessed netboot server automator action helps make that happen for Apple's net install and net restore sets. So Bless also has the ability to set a Mac to broadcast for an available server, which is described on the Bless man page. So let's take a look at how that works with the SIP netboot whitelist. So once again, we booted to recovery, and we're going to tell it that uh, we want to add 255, 255, 255, 255, as specified on the Bless man page. And let's just make sure that got added by running CSR util netboot list. All right, it's in there. So let's go ahead and uh, exit out and restart. All right, so we're going to go ahead and log in. And we're going to go back into terminal. And let's go ahead and run a CSR util status just to make sure everything looks good. So SIP is enabled, and our allowed netboot source is set for that special broadcast address. And we're going to run the command exactly shown on the man page. So sudo bless netboot server 255.255.255.255. Put in our password for sudo. Nope, SIP's not going to allow that. Uh, you need to specify the IP address. You, you, fortunately, you cannot use this method of just setting it up to look for a netboot server. Um, I double checked with uh, some Apple folks um, last month at WWDC, and their feedback was essentially they just see this as 
a security risk. And that's why it is blocked with SIP, even though it's still listed in the Bless Man page. So one other issue has to do with imaging. SIP is making parts of the OS read only, so how does that affect wiping your hard drive and imaging the machine? So let's take a look at this using Apple's Net Restore. So in this case, I'm going to wipe the boot drive and lay down just the OS and one account named administrator. So first thing, I'm going to verify that SIP is enabled. And it is. And now I'm going to go ahead and restart. And netboot off of a net restore set. Okay. Gonna get this process rolling. There's my disk. Gonna go ahead and select it, hit continue. Gonna go ahead and restore. Gonna lay down that new recovery partition. And let's go ahead and restart. OK, so now we've rebooted. And there we are at the login screen with just the administrator account showing. So how much did SIP affect our imaging process? It didn't affect it at all. Everything just worked. And that's the kind of experience that you can expect. Your imaging processes shouldn't be affected. If you're going to that level of I'm um, just wiping everything out, erasing the disk, and laying down a, uh, a fresh new image, that'll work exactly the same as it has before. As was mentioned earlier, SIPs protections will be disabled in specific circumstances where installer is installing software. So those special circumstances are where Apple has signed the installer package certificate with Apple's own certificate. So if you don't have access to Apple's certificate, installer will not be able to install to SIP protected locations. So as an example of this, we have an installer that somebody is building in packages, which is designed to install a text file into slash system. Very important text file, cannot possibly live anywhere else. So that person has handed off their installer to us, so let's go ahead and run it. And I also appreciate how you know, they just described exactly what this is supposed to be. So install important files into slash system. Very important, let's go ahead and run this. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hit uh, continue because I wanna get this process going. All right, yeah, Mac hard drive, let's go. All right, install, just keep hitting the buttons. Yeah, 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 put in my password. I'm gonna hurry here. Package is incompatible with this version of us. Uh, oh, there's an install anyway button, great. I'm gonna choose install anyway. <laughs> what? How did that happen? Installation failed. Man. So when we go into the logs to see why this failed, we will see these two messages logged. One is a warning saying that SIP is on and that the package will fail to install. The other one is an error saying that the package contains system content and that installer is expecting it to fail. That's why it warns you to say, hey, by the way, this might not work. So installer is aware of SIP. Uh, and it will try to warn you if you're trying to do something that uh, SIP won't allow. But it will also give you the chance to just go ahead anyway and watch a train wreck. <laughs> so to go along with installing items, Apple made a SIP exception, which I'd previously mentioned, which is likely important to a number of Mac admins. And that exception is for the user template directories located in slash system. Now, for those folks that modify the user template, you will still be able to do so on a SIP-protected Mac. So another concern is how SIP will affect the functionality of the software used on your Macs. So software from the Mac App Store will be fine. Um, Apple's been defining installation requirements for a while to make them work with SIP. Uh, vendors who have been following Apple's guidance on moving away from deprecated methods will likewise be fine. Uh, however, a lot of environments have to deal with older software or new software written by vendors who, shall we say, haven't updated certain components in a while. So I'm sure everyone has a vendor who's still using unsigned kernel extensions only stopped using startup items when Yosemite just flat made them not work anymore, or other functions which Apple has deprecated. So a number of vendors who fall into this category also posted support articles showing how to turn off Gatekeeper as part of the installation uh, process for their product, since they also weren't signing their installers. So for the next slide, just as a bit of fair warning, uh, I'm going to be getting up on my soapbox a bit. So over the course of this year, 
Um, I've seen support articles appearing from some vendors showing how to turn off SIP prior to installing their product. In my opinion, vendors who provide advice on how to turn off SIP on your Mac are providing a clear signal that they do not want your business. They're asking you to reopen the hole in the Mac security model that SIP is designed to close. And they are asking you to assume additional risk in your environment because they don't want to invest the time and resources needed to update their software. Demand better from those vendors or take your money and go somewhere else. All right, climbing back off the soapbox now. So if you've got older software that just can't be updated for SIP compatibility because it's abandonware or because the in-house person who wrote it has now retired and they're off sailing the world, that's a bit of a different problem. Um, in that case, I would still not recommend disabling SIP on your own machine. Instead, a better solution may be running it in a virtual machine or having an older machine that's dedicated to running it. So another example is how SIP affects browser plugins. So SIP's protection of Slash System affects XProtect configuration files as they are stored inside of Slash System. So as the XProtect configuration files will be locked against editing, this means that they can no longer be managed to allow older versions of the Flash and Java browser plugins to run. So if your shop includes a mission-critical system that requires using older Flash and Java browser plugins, please say no. I recommend working with your vendor or in-house developers to find out if the use of these browser plugins can be discontinued. Now, if their use can't be discontinued, see if the system in question can be updated to support the latest versions of these browser plugins and continue to be compatible as new versions of those browser plugins are released. So if updating the system is not an option, um, there is a way to allow older plugins to access specific sites. So by adding the needed uh, sites to a whitelist in Safari and setting those specific sites to allow always, those sites can still use that older browser plugin even if XProtect would otherwise block that plugin. So for example, if you have a site that requires the use of the Java 7 browser plugin, you've tested Java 8 and it just doesn't work, this is a way that you can continue to use specifically that site and it will work with your Java 7 browser plugin. Websites not included in the whitelist will still have the use of that plugin blocked. So another thing to know that because SIP writes to NVRAM, Resetting NVRAM back to factory defaults will also reset SIP back to its factory defaults. So its factory defaults are SIP is enabled, and there are no entries in the netboot whitelist. So in my testing, I've verified that a params app does this just fine. So since a params app clears NVRAM, performing a params app will reset SIP back to its factory defaults. So for folks who need to maintain netboot whitelist, I would recommend educating your colleagues about this behavior. Now, it is also possible to enable SIP protections and selectively disable parts of it by adding one or more flags to the CSR util enable command. All require being booted from recovery in order to set them. So for example, here's the command to enable SIP and allow the installation of unsigned kernel extensions. The other options available include enabling SIP while disabling the file system protections. Here's the command to enable SIP and disable the dtrace restrictions. Here's a command to enable SIP and disable the debug restrictions. Last but not least, here's how to enable SIP and disable your restrictions on writing to NVRAM. So when you run CSR util status, you should see that the other protections are, protections are listed as enabled, while the specific protection you indicated is now disabled. And one interesting part of Apple's uh, developer documentation for SIP is this note, indicating that it's possible to configure SIP for environments that can't access recovery. Now, when I followed up with Apple about this, Apple Enterprise Support told me that this meant that I could configure it using Netboot, using a Netboot set that included the needed recovery environment. So the example they used was leveraging a new option in system image utility to create a package-only installation Netboot set. And this is a set that's designed to install only scripts, configuration profiles, or installer packages, as opposed to installing a full OS. So to test this, I built a script that uses CSR util to add two IP addresses to the Netboot whitelist. So once I had my uh, script written, I built a package-only Netboot set using system image utility, and I added the script to it. So let's take a look at how this works. So first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and run CSR util status, and SIP is enabled. I'm going to go ahead and run CSR util Netboot list, and I don't currently have a Netboot whitelist. There's no uh, Netboot IP is currently configured. So let's go ahead and restart. All 
All right, I'm going to go ahead and netboot. Right, so let's get this process rolling. Let's go ahead and select English for the main language. I'm going to select my uh, boot drive, hit continue. It's going to go ahead and run that script. Just give it a few seconds to restart here. All right, let's go ahead and log in. And go back into terminal. And let's go ahead and run CSR util status again. And now I have uh, two IPs set up as allowed netboot sources, which means they're added to the whitelist. Now, you may have, while I was going through that demonstration, had a question occur to you. What if I need to set the netboot whitelist so that I can netboot and set the netboot whitelist? I posed that question back to Apple. They said, that's a really interesting problem. We'll get back to you. <laughs> they have not as of yet. So over the course of the past year, Apple's been tuning SIP as they see how SIP works in the real world, and they've been addressing problems as they crop up. Uh, as an example of this, a colleague of mine discovered back in 10.11.1 that you can delete user local, but then SIP would stop you from trying to put it back. So even after disabling SIP and recreating user local, my colleague still had trouble writing to directories inside of user local once he'd enabled SIP again. So as an example of how SIP updates are being uh, delivered by a system preference uh, via software update, Apple released an update that fixed this by adding the user local directory to the list of SIP exceptions normally used by third-party products. Now, for those interested in the details, the complete bug report is available via the link shown on the screen. And because you can never have too much information about something that's relatively new, um, we've got some useful links. Got some more useful links talking about uh, Netboot and how it works with system integrity protection. Also, information on uh, the parallels information that I mentioned earlier, along with more information on how BSDP and uh, helper addresses work. And possibly the most important link you see during this entire presentation, this is how you get it all. This is uh, where you download. Uh, PDF is available from the top link. It has the slides and the speaker's notes. Bottom link is the keynote slides. It includes the demos. It includes the speaker's notes. It includes the everything. So I'm going to leave that up on the screen. And uh, how are we doing on time? Do we have some 10 minutes for questions? All right. So I'm going to leave that up on the screen. I'm going to open the floor for anyone who asks questions. Uh, I think you had your hand up first. Um, that is, yeah, that is a good question. Uh, that is a question that I wish Tim Perfit from Two Canoe Software was here to answer. He does have a blog post uh, talking about how SIP affects uh, boot camp, um, and I'll post a link to that later. Uh, he goes in, he went into this in, in a pretty considerable detail, and I regret that I didn't have that in my list of links. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the one for, for uh, turning on SIP and just disabling the NVRAM protections, I think that would allow BLESS to continue working. It should. Uh, the problem then comes in making sure that you know, it, NVRAM doesn't get reset at some point. Is, is it protecting the EFI partition as well? I'm sorry? Is it protecting the EFI partition as well? Or is it just the NVRAM that's preventing that from occurring because? Yeah, the, it's because BLESS needs to write to NVRAM. And SIP is stopping it from running to NVRAM. That, that's where the, the process is falling down. Folks, before we take some more questions, uh, we might try using these handheld mics just so that everyone can hear the question and we get the recording of it for the, the oh, yes. session too. So um, next question. Sir. Uh, yeah, you mentioned um, the problems that you get with um, installer and um, if then refusing to install the file. 
um, when Joe User out there ignores all the warnings and goes right ahead, does um, is there a way of rolling back whatever was half installed before the failure occurred? Um, no, I mean, a failed install is a failed install. What should happen in that case, assuming that someone just goes ahead anyway, is that installer manages to install into parts of the OS that are not protected by SIP. It's simply, it'll have those parts installed and the parts that we're trying to install into SIP protected areas simply won't install. So you'll have kind of half and half. Um, you're kind of relying on someone to pay attention to the warnings as they pop up. But in my demonstration, I just demonstrated that you can just blow on past them. So there's no way to roll back? Mm, not that I'm aware of. Uh, yeah, it's like any failed install. You kind of have to tweeze it out. Yeah. I saw lots of hands before. <laughs> Can't have all have been asking the same question that Tony asked. <laughs> Are you seeing anything in um, uh, Sierra that is giving you cause for concern at this point in terms of how they're continuing to work on? Um, without going into much detail on Sierra, since that's still largely covered under uh, NDA, I will say that uh, I asked about SIP um, and if there were any changes for Sierra. Uh, and the answer to that is contained within the notes that I have posted to the, uh, dev to the Apple developer forums. Um, I can post a link to that so you can go look up what is posted there for yourselves, unfortunately, because it's still technically, yeah. you know, it's under NDA. I don't feel comfortable speaking at it, about it at a recorded session. Understood. But uh, I can post, you know, I can tweet that link uh, later so everyone can go read those results for themselves. Come on, this is your chance to ask Rich lots of questions. Don't be shy. Nobody made eye contact. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, um, we're a little early, but that's fine. So, oh, oh what, there is one. one. <laughs> it's told on. How do you split your time between your blog and the fantastic research you do um, and your full time job? Oh, um, so how do I split my time between uh, what I'm writing and what I'm doing at my full time job? Um, I have a very uh, understanding and supporting employer. Um, and often what will happen is I will be writing something up for documentation at work. And I'll think that will make a good blog entry. So I just, I need to take out any internal details, anything that's work specific. Uh, sometimes I need to rewrite the entry quite a bit on that regards. Um, and, you know, basically uh, blog. Uh, it, it goes uh, like internal knowledge base, and then it gets rewritten and sometimes re-screenshot, and then it winds up on the blog. So I'm already kind of working on that as, in this, that same kind of process. And I've also had it work the other way, where uh, someone mentions a problem, and I think, oh, this is going to be a problem for our environment. So I go ahead and I write it up for the blog, and then I think I should also write this up for the internal knowledge base as well. So in that case, it goes blog internal knowledge base instead of the usual workflow of internal knowledge base log. So yeah, it's just. And I just find time. <laughs> yes. Digressing from um, purely SIP, a great talk, by the way. Um, what are the things that you're most passionate with or um, enjoy most about OSX or you know, sort of uh, your, your favorite things to work with on the platform? Um, that is a good question. Uh, I enjoy that in many ways. So part of this is I've been doing this for a long time. I got started in the late 90s, which was probably the exact wrong time to get involved in Mac IT. <laughs> um, and I was working in a university computer lab. And my choices were working on Windows 3.1 and working on uh, System 7.5. I think when I got started there, it was System 7.5.3. And the multitasking, I mean, Windows 3.1 just didn't multitask. It, you know, you send anything to the background and just stopped. Um, I liked working with the Macs. I thought they were easier to work with. And that, that, that ease of use that I understand what's going on kind of just went along. And when I hit OS X, there, was, you know, there were considerable changes, but there was still enough familiar that I was like, OK, I can, I can do this. I can, I can learn this. And it's just kind of gone on from there where uh, 
just about nothing that I learned back in those you know, now long gone days is really directly applicable to OS X anymore, but it still feels that way with that continuity. And I just enjoy finding little things uh, and you know, about the operating system that I've been using it for years and years and years that I never knew about. Like for example, one of my recent blog entries was how to show and hide your desktop icons. Yeah, I've been using OS X for, uh, Lord, like a decade and a half now. I had no idea that existed. And, you know, you talk to people like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've known about that for years and years. And I'm just like, this is amazing. This is new. This is stuff I don't know. And that's the kind of thing that really keeps me going. Still finding, even after all these years, even after all the OS releases, I'm still finding these little things that uh, make my computing experience better. Okay, got time for at least one more, if you would like. You're all just shy, aren't you? You're going to throw lots of questions at Rich in the breaks, I know. And that's perfectly fine, too. <laughs> okay, all right, well, we'll call it quits there. Thank you, Rich. Really good talk.